He was an entertainer loved and admired across the globe. <laughs> he was a gigantic star. He was on the telly the whole time. He had a name that was just a household name. But when rumours began to emerge about a dark past, the public was stunned. Some people didn't want to believe it because Rolf Harris had been a bit of a trusted member of their childhood. The man who we thought we knew on TV was not the man who he was. He was, in fact, a person who had a dark side, the dark side that was revealed in court. At his trial, the full story of the abuse carried out by the television star was laid bare. The main victim was the best friend of his daughter, Bindi. He continued that abuse over the next 10, 15 years. The actions of Rolf Harris were crimes that shook Britain. In May 2014, the trial began of arguably one of the most recognisable faces on television. After rumours about his behaviour began to surface and victims began to speak out, Rolf Harris found himself facing 12 counts of indecent assault. Morning, Mr Harris. Rolf Harris was basically an icon of British entertainment. He'd been in the show business industry for years, decades. I knew him growing up, Rolf Harris's cartoon time. Rolf Harris on Saturday. He was on the telly the, the whole time. I think everybody watched Rolf Harris growing up. He's been around for 60 years. He's always been a, a warm and friendly presence in everybody's household. He's always been there. I watched him, everybody watched him. Rolf Harris was one of the, the gigantic stars of Australian television and also, of course, British television. Um, it's very rare that a, a person can be such a celebrity that their name alone, their Christian name alone, will symbol them to the whole world. There's no doubt that Rolf Harris, you know, in my own childhood, Rolf Harris was kind of, um, you know, he, he drew the funny pictures and he was a nice guy and, I'd, you know, I'd like to meet him. And the key thing for me as a child was if I met Rolf Harris, I think I'd know him. I, I'd never met him, but if I met him because I'd seen him on TV, I would feel that I knew Rolf Harris. Uh, and I think that's what made it more shocking that, that we, we, you feel you know him, uh, you feel you've got a sense of his personality, and actually what the court case really clearly demonstrated was there was a darker side to Rolf Harris. Over the coming weeks, the respective legal teams would explore this dark side to determine if Harris's accusers had indeed been victims of decades of sexual abuse or were simply making it all up. It was quite a long trial. It lasted a good five, six weeks from memory. And I remember the first day starting and seeing Rolf Harris arrive at court. He emerged in a big people carrier, stepped out. In fact, he did the same thing, basically the same routine every day. He came out of the people carrier, accompanied by his wife, Orwin, and his daughter, Bindi, as well. There was just no remorse in him. You know, he thought his fame was going to get him off and singing and behaving in a way that was just absolutely indifferent. We were dealing with cases of indecent assault against young children and, and I, I know it's a well-worn cliche, but you really could hear a pin drop when the prosecution opened her case for the Crown against Rolf Harris. She was very, very good. She basically described how Rolf Harris was a Jekyll and Hyde character who, who was well known for his public persona. But on the other side, he had a very dark and sinister character, a dark and sinister character that had, had abused young girls for the best part of 20 years. The continuous media coverage of the case ensured that the public were becoming all too aware of the charges against the previously adored star. I think the entire world, when they first heard that Rolf Harris was under suspicion for sexual abuse, was horrified and would have felt totally hoodwinked by the notion that this man, who had been such a benign and friendly presence in their lives for so long, could even be accused of, of things so terrible. 
the fact that Harris was so family friendly and was so well known for working with children, with animals in a family setting is what's caused most uh, of the victims so much shock. Stay strong. You're innocent, Walt. Rolf Harris was, in fact, a person who had a dark side, the dark side that was revealed in court. The man who we thought we knew on TV was not the man who he was. Harris presented a very empathetic, warm sort of presence. He was very good with pets, he was very good with children, he was very good at cracking jokes and all the rest. Yet in his spare time, he was also attacking women and he was groping and he was taking advantage. You can't be both of those things. As the trial developed, it would emerge that seemingly Harris could indeed be both these things. The former international star was facing multiple charges of indecent assault against women and children. If found guilty, his life and career would be in ruins. The desperate state he found himself in was a far cry from his upbringing in Western Australia. Rolf was born in 1930 and he grew up in, in a West Australian suburb known as Bazendine which is about 11 kilometres from the centre of Perth. It's very fancy real estate now because it backs onto the Swan River. But during his childhood, it was in fact uh, a bit of a fly-blown backwater of a place. And Rolf had the sort of childhood that many children would have had in Australia at that time, a very outdoor childhood. He rode his bike to school every day and he talked about swimming in the river behind his house. He talked about ripping off his clothes as soon as he got home from school and jumping in the river. By the age of 14, he was a national backstroke swimming champion. And it was a very idyllic sort of upbringing. He was very happy. His father was a, uh, loved to sing. His mother got him into piano lessons very early on. Uh, and he described it in a very happy way. He talked about being a natural show off from the start. He liked performing for other school children. As he grew up, he moved into university and didn't do so well at it. He then became a teacher for a brief time and then uh, fate intervened in his life. What happened was he caught a meningitis type illness. The effect of that is, is, is that whilst he was recuperating, he decided then that he would like to be an artist. And not only would he like to be an artist, but he'd like to go to England and try to do that. And that's where he went when he was 22 years of age. In Australia, Back in the 50s and 60s, it was a, a sort of rite of passage for, for some Australians to go to England, to go to the motherland, to visit London and to do that sort of thing. And if you look at successful Australians who have done that in a big way, say your Jermaine Greers, your, your Clive Jameses, your, your Barry Humphreys, those sorts, uh, Rolf Harris did it a decade or two before they did it. And in, in some ways he insinuated himself in popular culture in a, in a, in a far more lasting and successful way than any other Australian. Rolf certainly did uh, rise very quickly in the television ranks. He, his start, beginning in television coincided more or less with the beginning of television itself. Um, and one of the things that was often done in children's entertainment was to try to have a show that taught them how to draw. That tended to be very boring entertainment. The reason it was so boring is that it was looked laboriously slow. Rolf put up a different proposition. He, could, he was a very good artist, but he was also very quick. And what that meant was that he could draw very fast and entertain at the same time, which is what he did. He was very good at uh, joking to the camera, talking to the children, and he would practised at home. He practised talking to a door handle making out as a camera. So he had this instant warmth with the viewers at home. They all felt that he was talking to them. Now, once he'd moved out of children's television, that this, this quality was, was recognised. And he then moved into adult um, variety entertainment during the evening and once again was a very big star. He began a, a show on Saturday night on the BBC, which became the biggest show of its day. Only two years later, in 1969, with Harris's star firmly on the rise, would come his first documented abuse of a child. In May 2014, 
Entertainer Rolf Harris was enduring a spectacular fall from grace, facing 12 charges of indecent assault against women and children over a period of 20 years, with one victim as young as 12. Prosecutors believe victims were deterred by his celebrity status. During his trial, as the sordid details of his past were laid out, it was all too easy to forget quite how huge a star he once was. Tell him nothing. <laughs> he could sing, although he wasn't the greatest singer that's ever been born. One, two, three. He wasn't the greatest artist either, even though the power of television at one point had him the most recognised painter in Britain ahead of people like Rembrandt and Van Gogh. But he could paint enough and he could draw enough to keep crowds entertained. And, of course, he was a great celebrity. He was very good at comparing shows. He had a good humour about him and a good feel about him. What do you think? Does that look like anything like the fella? <laughs> I assumed from the start that Rolf was a perfectionist. And he probably is and was then. Don't let's take anything away from the man. He's an immense talent. Uh, you can't write that off just because of what's come out since. He seemed to be aloof. He seemed to be not too interested in what everybody else around him was doing. And I put that down to professionalism. He was totally focused on trying to do the job. That was that side of him. The performer, Rolf, was terribly focused. And that's fine. I, nobody had any problem with that. You just couldn't reach him. There was no way that I could have struck up a conversation, sat down and had a chat. He's not the kind of guy you'd have a beer with. We were working on a comedy show and we were doing comedy sketches. Now, the audience are going to hear the same gag lines over and over again sometimes. You want them to laugh. The way to do that is to keep them cheerful in the gaps while you're rearranging the lights. So I took it upon myself to entertain the audience a bit and act like a bit of a warm-up man in between takes. And this went on for a couple of nights and nobody said anything, it was going fine. Then Rolf wandered over to me at the side of the set, in the shadows, as it were, and said, uh, I'll do the funny stuff, mate, all right? And walked away. And that's about the only time, outside of doing the sketches, that he actually spoke to me in the entire production. And I thought that said an awful lot about him at the time. Until that time, until that moment, I thought he was just aloof. And from that moment, I thought, nah, you're an arsehole. As well as his work on television, Harris was also developing what would grow into a hugely successful music career. Rolf had numerous hits as well. They were more or less novelty hits. The first one that he had was, uh, he wrote in 1957, a song called Tie Me Kangaroo Down Sport. He did borrow it a little bit from another source, but then he put his own flavour to it and it became a number one hit around the world. The other one, of course, was a song called Two Little Boys. It was actually the top song, number one song, uh, at the end of the 60s, and it moved over into the 70s as the number one song as well. Colossal sales, um, and still, still a song that many people associate with their childhood today. Whilst his showbiz career blossomed, one of Harris's early passions was art, something he would eventually become synonymous with. Art was more important to him than music. Uh, his grandfather was an artist. He was, he was painting from a very early age. He was entering paintings in contests uh, from a very early age. He wanted to be a painter. It was this love of art that led to Rolf meeting his wife and eventually starting a family. Rolf met his future wife, Alwyn Hughes, when he first attended art school in England. It was a, something of a whirlwind romance in that I believe that, um, according to his, um, his writings, that they um, agreed to get married after their second date. Very soon afterwards, they moved to Perth in Western Australia when Rolf was headhunted by Perth Television. Television was then new in Perth. And then they had Bindi in 1964. That was their one and only daughter. Despite having a new family, Harris struggled to combine home life and a burgeoning showbiz career. Rolf has described himself as a workaholic and has expressed regrets about the way that he's treated his family uh, in putting his work ahead of his family. Uh, Elwyn has, in his autobiography, Rolf talks about finding diary 
uh, notes from Elwyn where she talks about contemplating suicide because she's so bored uh, and, and being uh, so sort of uh, unhappy with life because Rolf is working all the time and he has expre expressed many regrets about not spending more time with the family. Bindi too later on talked about the fact that her father would, would give more attention to a strange child on the street than, than he would to, her, to his own daughter. So certainly it wasn't a happy family in that regard. On other levels, he, he portrayed it as being a very happy family. And he wanted it to be a happy family, one would expect. But obviously there, there, there were eruptions beneath the surface. In 1969, only five years after his daughter was born, Harris would go on to abuse his first victim. Harris's youngest victim was seven or eight. And even by that stage, he was well known. Uh, and she went to a community centre where he was there, I think, signing his records or signing something. And she, you know, queues up for an autograph and is sexually assaulted by him in front of everyone. They can't see what's happening, but it shows the arrogance of the man in, in thinking that he's never going to get caught. Uh, you wonder whether he got some sort of a kick from doing it in front of other people. Harris's perverted actions had a catastrophic effect on the child. In her impact statement, she stated, it took away my childhood. It affected every aspect of my life from the point he assaulted me. For her, you know, so young um, and uh, really not understanding what had happened uh, and having to go over it time and time again, absolutely devastating. I think it's really important that we understand what happens when somebody is abused. What you have is you have somebody who's relatively powerful vis-a-vis -vis the person they're about to abuse who is vulnerable. And that power and that vulnerability are used by the abuser to groom the person they want to abuse and manipulate them. Because for the abuse to take place, that the victim has to be manipulated so that they won't tell anybody, that it's a secret, that it's something that somehow the, the blame can be reversed, that actually it's kind of your fault if you're the victim, is how the, how the process works from the abuser's perspective. The main reason why many victims don't speak out is that they fear that they will never be believed, they blame themselves. If they were very young children and it happened only once, um, they replay it over and over again in their minds as to whether they were actually imagining it. All those things together, that sense of guilt, that sense of shame, which has been put upon you by what's happened to you, means that actually, quite reasonably, at the time, maybe what you decide, actually, I'm just going to just do that and pretend it didn't happen. For many people, that pain that lives with them well into their into adulthood, we need to worry much more about how we can help people after abuse so that the problems they otherwise might face in their adulthood can be dealt with much earlier. During the trial in 2014, the jury would hear from a number of Harris's victims and the damaging legacy of his abuse. One, however, would stand out, a victim he preyed on for many years. She wasn't a random stranger, however. She was his own daughter's best friend. Artist, TV star and former national treasure Rolf Harris is now vilified as a sexual predator who abused young women for over 30 years. But at the height of his fame, he was entertaining audiences across the globe. Throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, Rolf was a gigantic star around the world. Uh, he fronted numerous specials. He had a, a lot of shows that were named after him, specifically about him. Some were on art, some were children's entertainment. Whenever there was a royal special. Rolf seemed to be one of those people who was invariably in the cast. Um, he was a, a big star around the world and he was known as a household name at that time. The 1980s also marked the start of arguably one of the most sickening periods of abuse attributed to Harris during his trial. They centered on his daughter's best friend, a young girl who Harris preyed on for over 15 years. 
The main victim was, of course, the best friend of Harris's daughter, Bindi. They lived opposite each other, uh, and they had grown up together uh, as children, and they would be in each other's houses all the time. The first assault occurred when the Harrises took my client away with them on holiday um, to Australia. And so you're talking about someone who's 13, uh, miles away from home, never been on a you know, holiday without her parents before, with her best friend's parents, and she is suddenly uh, and, and quite violently sexually assaulted by a man who was her, the father of her best friend and absolutely shocking and she was terrified of him and that's why you know people always say oh why did you know they put up with it for so long and how was it allowed to continue she was terrified of him and she remained terrified of him harris would abuse his victim both when she visited his daughter and in her own home most shocking of all was an instance when he abused her in bed when his own daughter was asleep in the same bedroom his victim was 15 harris was 50. What's most shocking about this case is that the jury found that he continued that abuse over the next 10, 15 years without a care for her welfare and not a care at all, without showing any empathy or understanding or recognition for the damage that he was doing. It went against the Rolf Harris who had been on our TV screens for decades. Rolf Harris! It was very, very sad because, as a result of the assaults, this young girl um, took to drink in order to you know, forget about what was happening. And so, from a very early age, she was drinking. And when she knew that she was going to see Harris, so, for example, if he was coming over to the family, she would drink in advance, thinking that he was going to assault her. And uh, very frequently, he did. It was with no sort of affection or, you know, this wasn't someone who was, you know, attracted to her. It was a violent, unpleasant, horrible sexual assault on, on someone who was terrified of him. Harris's abuse was not only confined to his daughter's best friend. Other women across the globe would also fall victim to his predatory ways with television studios often providing him with ample opportunities. The show was called Rolf, and it was, it was just the Rolf doing his shtick. Bad puns and dad jokes. It wasn't, it wasn't cutting edge comedy, it was classic Rolf. I was in the makeup department. I had my makeup done. I stood out of the chair, Rolf sat down, was having his makeup done, and I was just standing behind him, slightly to one side, while the makeup artist worked on Rolf. I seemed to think she was dusting him down or something, but whatever it was, she was right in front of him and she had to lean forward to get to his face, quite reasonably. As she did that, Rolf's hands, both of them, shot straight out towards her breasts and she instinctively pulled back. I think he made momentary contact. She pulled away from him. He turned around to me with a sort of a cheeky, naughty boy smile on his face and went <laughs> which I thought was quite bizarre. There's always horseplay goes on, you know, around dressing rooms, around TV, theatre, whatever. There's all that kind of thing. But that was a step too far for me. That was different. That was somebody actually trying to feel somebody up. As the decade progressed, Harris's star appeared to wane. Rolf was a consummate entertainer. He recognised that he needed to keep reinventing himself if he wanted to keep his audience. There's probably two things that happened for Rolf that kept him going and, and reinvented him. One of them was his recording of Stairway to Heaven, which is, is something of a novelty song. It tended to reintroduce him to a new generation. Um, he ended up going to music festivals. The second thing that worked for Rolf was Animal Hospital, which went for many, many seasons, and that showed him in a, a very empathetic, warm sort of light, and that brought a whole new audience to Rolf Harris at a very, you know, later age in life. Harris's comeback was complete in 2005, 
when he was asked to paint a portrait of the Queen. The picture has since disappeared. Despite this renaissance, Harris's abuse of women across the globe allegedly continued. But now rumours about his shocking behaviour were beginning to surface. It was a Melbourne radio station where a very well-known Australian celebrity was in the station and there was a school group coming through having a tour of the radio station and when this well-known celebrity heard that the school group was there and that Rolf Harris was in the building, he panicked, he literally panicked and ordered the school group to be, in effect, evacuated from the building because he knew, or, or from what he said, he, he feared that Rolf Harris would get close to the girls and start groping the girls. Whilst the suspicions about Harris were undoubtedly growing, he managed to avoid the spotlight by hiding behind a wall of silence. In hindsight, a lot of people probably knew that things happened, but nobody talked to anybody else about it. So when I saw the incident in the makeup department, I seriously, until a couple of years ago, believed that, that was one and only. It was a one-off. It was a rare incident. I knew nothing about any of the other stuff. Now, I've heard since that a lot of people knew that that was his reputation. Uh, people have been in touch with me and said, oh, yes, I knew all about Dirty Rolf. What stuns me, of course, is that nobody ever said anything. But then, you know, in court, I put my hand up at the same time and said, I felt um, ashamed that I never said anything at the time. Grab that position about there, that's good, yeah. that's good. As a result of the revelations about disgraced DJ Jimmy Savile in 2012, the Metropolitan Police launched Operation Utree to investigate the abuse allegations centered on Savile and others. The publicity the operation received encouraged more victims to speak out, victims who until then had remained silent. For somebody to abuse a child and think they can get away with it, they need to be able to use their position of authority, of power, of influence, wherever that comes from. And in the case of uh, Rolf Harris, in the case of Savile, it, it was about celebrity and, and the, the pedestal they were on, they were held on by you know, the, those who were, they were working with, um, the, you know, their, their fans and so on. But equally, that could be power that comes from the fact you were in a position of authority over a, over a child, or it could be somebody you know, within the sort of close friend of the family, you know, someone within the family. That's the power that's being used. And that power um, is not just the power to manipulate the child who's being abused, but in the case of Rolf Harris, if there were people around him who were relying on their, you know, on for their livelihoods, or it could be people in, in Rolf Harris's family who had concerns, but actually that's a massive step to take, isn't it? You know, you know, say to actually point your finger at someone in the family. That is the same in all abusive situations. You know, there, there are always people close to, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, but actually the step of actually saying, I'm worried and therefore I'm going to do something, that's a really big step and, and takes an awful lot of, of courage. Am I going to be believed? In May 2015, a damning report illustrated the true scale of child abuse throughout British society, with police revealing that over 1,400 men were under investigation in relation to child abuse offences. Of those, 261 were high-profile individuals, either celebrities or politicians. The Savile effect on society has been enormous, and even before Savile, there were lots of cases of abuse, mainly arising out of the Catholic Church or care homes, but everyone was a bit distant from those. It was all about someone else's life that didn't concern you. And I think because Savile was spread over such a range of different people from all walks of life, from all parts of the country, that people have now been able to speak much more openly. And because of what has happened since in people coming forward, abuse is much more openly spoken about, not just in our generation, but in our children's generation. And the Harris and other convictions has also shown that, you know, we must never be bowled over by someone's status again. With the main victim, she didn't tell anyone for a long time. It actually wasn't until she saw him performing on the Queen's Golden Jubilee on the television that she saw him and, and she was furious that, um, you know, she felt he's got away with it, he's still ruining my life, I'm still having to look at him, he's still famous when he's done this to me. And, and that's what gave her the power to go to the police. What followed was a lengthy police investigation 
to gather more evidence against Harris. He was arrested last month as part of Operation U-Tree, some of which relates to claims against Jimmy Savile, some of which doesn't. When detectives finished their work, his victims couldn't help but wonder whether their abuser would hide behind his celebrity status again, or whether a jury would see behind the facade. I found it extremely arrogant to have the gall to say to witness after witness, you're lying, you're making this up. This poor innocent man is the victim of some giant conspiracy. Give me a break. During a career that had lasted 50 years, TV star Rolf Harris had managed to lead a double life. On one hand, he was the consummate entertainer, loved by millions. On the other, he was a sexual predator who left a trail of abused young women in his wake. Now, though, he was due to face judgment in a court of law. In May 2014, at Southwark Crown Court in South London, he would stand trial charged with 12 counts of indecent assault. Seven of them were against his daughter's best friend and the others were against children as young as seven, eight years old, uh, up until 14, 15. And they were over a, a 20 or so year period from the late 1960s until the late 1980s, at a time when he was a main player in, in British show business, when his face was being beamed into living rooms all across the country. The most frustrating things I would say over the last couple of years is when we've heard the words witch hunt used against Utree and, and the other high profile cases around the country. The high profile because they're investigating celebrities and the first thing I would say is are, are we actually seeing we're sitting in a world in which because you're a celebrity who's used your power as a celebrity to actually abuse in the first place is not able to use their, their celebrity to actually avoid being investigated and being convicted. You know that's clearly got to be a nonsense. We can't be in a world in which somehow if it happened 20, 30 years ago, it's, you know, they can get away with it. That impact, that pain, didn't just happen in 1968 or 1969 in Rolf Harris's case. It's happening now for the victims. That's why they went to court and were prepared to go through what they, they went through in a witness box, look him in the eyes again, because he made them go to court because he, you know, he wouldn't admit his guilt. That's why they did it, because they're still feeling the pain today and they wanted justice. These are women who are having to go through the most intimate items of evidence, uh, and they've all found that very, very, very distressing. One of my clients, you know, found it deeply, deeply personal, uh, and it is actually, for her, the most upsetting of, of the whole incident, is the, the giving of your most intimate secrets um, to a, a packed courtroom. Despite the bravery of the witnesses, prosecution faced the very real challenge of proving the alleged offences, as most of them had occurred many years ago. With these cases, it's always one person's word against another. That's the key thing in these cases. And it's always very hard for the prosecution to prove them. But he himself, I think what actually was the nail for Rolf Harris was this rather damning letter which he'd written to the father of his daughter's best friend, in, in which he had said that what he thought was going on was just basically reciprocated and that she was a willing partner in it and that he hadn't meant to uh, offend her or hurt her, there'd been no rape. I think the letter was I extremely important for the jury and it was also a turning point in the trial. I suspect, you know, Harris wouldn't have believed for a minute that the family would have kept that letter. And um, I think it was a very, very valuable piece of evidence and so very rare to get that in in this type of a case you know normally you have absolutely no documentary evidence at all nothing uh, no dna nothing and so to have that sort of a, a semi-admission was pivotal contained within the letter was a damning sentence harris wrote to his victim's family I said, why didn't you just say no? He claimed his victim replied, how could I say no to the great television star, Rolf Harris? It's a very self-indulgent letter, and that's what the victims all say about him, that, you know, he was only ever interested in himself. And it, that shows in the fact that he didn't do the decent thing, he didn't plead guilty, he put these victims through a horrific trial. He's never, ever given any sort of apology since his conviction. And so nothing is focused on 
the victims and what he's done to them. Another vital element of the prosecution case were the witnesses who would give evidence not about direct abuse, but about Harris's character. We heard a very graphic description, I remember, from an Australian makeup artist who was involved in a production in Australia. And she described him as an octopus. She said that he was known as the octopus because his hands were literally all over female production staff in, involved in the making of the TV series. I first read in the Australian newspapers that a, a makeup artist had allegedly been groped by Rolf. I assumed it was the one that I'd seen. I was still too naive to realise there might have been others. And I thought, the chances are she's going to get into the witness box and members of the jury are going to say, as people do, you're a woman, you're making all this up, you were dressed inappropriately, in some way you asked for it. It's all nonsense, but people still do think that way. So I thought if I don't put my hand up and say, as the only person in the room at the time, you know, I'm a witness, I saw this happen, corroborate what she said, she's going to be all on her own there. So I contacted the prosecution, Sasha Wass, and said, um, you know, would you like me to give you a written statement, which then snowballed into me talking to the Met, the police in England, uh, and eventually ending up standing in the witness box. I asked the Met at the time, is this the same person that I saw? And they said, we can't tell you, and that was fair enough. So it was some time later when the papers started printing more details that I realised the penny dropped. And then I thought, my God, that's two. How many more are there? The tactic employed by Harris's defense team to counter the mounting evidence against their client was to simply suggest the witnesses and victims were lying. I was annoyed a bit when they started saying things like, you're making this up. Now, I know it's a courtroom tactic. We've all seen enough TV drama to know that. But at the same time, I, I found it extremely arrogant to have the gall to say to witness after witness, you're lying, you're making this up. This poor innocent man is the victim of some giant conspiracy. Give me a break. It, it, it was just so patently absurd that I, I thought, either this guy has decided this is the defence he wants to follow, or he needs to ask for his money back, because it was just bizarre. Almost four weeks into the trial, and after hours of traumatic evidence, came a turning point. One of the most dramatic elements, or one of the most dramatic parts of the trial was the, the evidence surrounding the Cambridge victim. She was around about 14, 15 years old and had said that she'd been uh, assaulted by Rolf Harris in Cambridge in the mid-1970s when she was working at a It's a Knockout type event that was being hosted on a, on a green in, in Cambridge. And she remembered it vividly. She remembered that uh, she'd seen Rolf Harris uh, playing around on the floor, behaving like a dog and barking, and that he'd suddenly come up to her and, and groped her and, and assaulted her. She said that she returned to her workmates who were working in this marquee and said that, uh, and her friends said to her, why are you so red-faced? And, and she said, well, you won't believe what's just happened to me. You won't believe what Rolf Harris has just done to me. But again, she didn't tell anyone in authority about what had happened to her. And Rolf Harris was adamant, absolutely adamant, said, I've no, no, never been to Cambridge. And then all of a sudden, we then discovered, uh, there was a, a dramatic point that the prosecutor said, well, when they represented the evidence, they said, well, we've actually been contacted by someone who had managed to find footage that they'd videoed back in the 1970s of Rolf Harris actually appearing at this It's a Knockout style event in Cambridge. And it was played to the court several times and we saw it uh, on a monitor and it was slowed down deliberately and you could easily see Rolf Harris there taking part in a swimming event. You could tell that this was a defining moment in the trial because he had been so adamant that he hadn't been to Cambridge. I think everyone knew then, and I think he must have known as well, well, this doesn't look good for me because it shows that I, I have been lying. At the end of June, the jury found Rolf Harris guilty of 12 counts of indecent assault. His five-year sentence, however, was a bitter disappointment to his victims. The restraints that the judge had was that he had to impose the appropriate sentences that were in place at the time when the offences were committed. Um, so he would have uh, received a much heavier sentence if the offences had been committed now. 
The victims were very upset by the short length of the sentence, uh, and in fact, that's what spurred a lot of them uh, on to take civil action against him. The fact that he had showed no remorse, the fact he had behaved so arrogantly, and also the length of the sentence. And in fact, that is what prompted some more victims uh, to come forward who weren't involved in the first trial, who felt that he had got off too lightly. There was a great feeling that this was a celebrity witch hunt, that lots of money had been spent pursuing DJs and other personalities from the 60s and 70s for minor sexual offences that were part of that era. And Harris convictions have been hugely important because they have shown that no one is above the law um, and that it doesn't matter who you are, you can achieve justice, you can achieve justice decades later. In June 2015, a letter emerged, allegedly written by Harris in prison. In it, the author referred to his victims as money-grabbing wenches. If authentic, it would appear that the star showed little comprehension of the suffering he had caused. Rolf Harris, because of his gigantic celebrity status, may have somehow figured that normal rules of behaviour don't apply, but we'll never quite know what he was thinking. I wonder if he's still sitting in jail denying that any of this ever happened, or that he wasn't responsible, that he was just a victim, or has he had a chance to sit there and think, by oh, gee, I've screwed up deluxe. I don't know, I don't know, only time will tell. Someone one day will get to Rolf and ask him all those questions. In the meantime, there's an awful lot of people who are saying, well, at least justice has been done. It's taken 30 years, but at least it's been done. I think Rolf Harris has lost everything as a result of the trial. In 1995, he was asked, what is your greatest fear? His answer was, not being loved. Well, frankly, Rolf Harris is loved by nobody anymore as a result of what he's done. <laughs>